Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 361 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and an author. Our third book is called From Letters to Leaders, Leveraging Your Fraternity or Sorority Experience to Land Your Dream Job. So go and pick up that book today on Amazon. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there's nothing like great food to bring college students together. Fun fact, my son is going to be a freshman data science major this fall and discussions on the future of AI, which is artificial intelligence, that seems to be a regular conversation around the dinner table. It's funny how Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook completely abandoned his ideas for the metaverse. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And now completely focusing on integrating all of his platforms with artificial intelligence. I can't wait to talk more about AI today with our next guest and how that could impact writers well into the future. Now, let me tell you about our next guest. When Todd Bryson began writing, he had really big goals, but ultimately he wound up following a two-step process. He would write a post, and then he would pray for attention. Later, when the internet matured and creators started getting paid to post, the process changed for him slightly. At that time, it looked like this, write a post and then pray for money. The first half of that story led him to a world of scraping together a lot of tone-deaf half-truths for thirsty self-improvement seekers. The second half led him to take a few stabs at political writing for no other reason than because it was popular at the time. He could not have cared less about politics, but he still chased down that cash cow. Somewhere in between drawn out doses of dopamine from a string of fake attention metrics, he forgot a simple truth. You write because you have something to say. Now he's on a mission to publish words that matter again. Welcome to the show, Todd. Hey, thank you, Michael. I'm so happy to be on and chat today. It should be a good time. I love chatting with a fellow Tennessean, especially somebody from Dixon. So we are very, very close indeed. And uh, it's just an honor to meet you. What can I say? Thanks so much for being on the show. Yeah, of course. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about your background. I know that you decided on East Tennessee State University for your undergraduate experience. So all of our listeners want to know, why did you decide on ETSU? Yeah, that's a good story because I, I've, I've been asked this a couple of times now, and I realized that my LinkedIn must not be all the way up to date because I actually didn't spend my first year at ETSU. So my first year out of high school I wanted to play golf. Like I was a kid with a four iron in his hand and wanted to go pro. And at the end of my senior year, I signed up to play with Martin Methodist College. And already I probably should have said, okay, if you're signing with a you know NIA school, probably pro golf is a long, long shot at best. But I was 19 and I had dreams. And so I took my clubs and I went to Martin Methodist, uh, put a big strain on the relationship that my high, high school girlfriend and I had at the time because she went to a different school. Um, and so, you know, I had the dream. I was working through Martin Methodist College. I was trying to play some golf. I was trying to keep a relationship up. But it just, long story short, it just wasn't working out. And so I get to the end of my first year at this private school. There are 945 kids or something like that. You knew you knew everyone on campus, right? Because you saw them every day. Um, and I'm out of money. Like I'm out of the savings that my dad had set aside. I'm, I'm out of my scholarship money for golf. And I know that I need some sort of change. Um, and in the meantime, like the relationship had, had come to a breaking point and, th and that had gone away. And uh, I'm stuck, right? Because I go, man, I, I don't have enough money to keep chasing this dream at a private school. I have a couple options that I that I think I can chase, but I don't know where to go. And my mom, being the wonderful mother that she is, um, helped me do some of the work for me. So I wake up one morning in my bedroom and there are three posters on the wall. And I'm like, what the heck is this? And one poster says Nashville State, which is a local community college. And it has like pros and cons, like literally a list. She had done the cost analysis and everything for me. She said, Nashville State, pros and cons. She wrote um, Tennessee Tech University, which is another school most people are familiar with. Pros and cons, like wrote out all those things. That's where she went. So I think that's why she put it in the middle. She was doing like the best value tier thing. And then on the far right said, it's at East Tennessee University. I was like, okay, your ex-girlfriend is there. The price is this, whatever, all the pros and cons. Flash forward to the end of the summer. I've been looking at these posters the whole time. Um, 
And I decided to go all in on love. Honestly, like my ex-girlfriend and I kind of like figured some things out. And so I made the choice. I, I chased her up there. And so I would like to say it was a more logical, rational career decision, but the truth is, um, you know, I went up, I went up there for a girl and that's how it happened. <laughs> you did it all for love. <laughs> what a all great for story. love. What a great story. Whatever happened to her? Uh, we just celebrated 10 years of marriage last October. So, <laughs> so there you how about go. that? <laughs> so you know what? So it all worked out. I mean, it, it played right. out the way that the universe wanted it to play out. Yeah, yeah, it worked. <laughs> it worked in my favor. I'm not sure all stories go like that, but hey, I, I chose love and I still do. That's the way it goes. I love it. Well, you won both ways then. So that's uh, that's really No really doubt. Good. No <laughs> doubt. Now, when you first started writing, we talked about it. I mean, it was really just praying for attention with your pieces. Um, then it evolved into praying for money. What do you think that aspiring writers really should be concerned about? Yeah. Well, I think when I think back to that time, you know, when I was pr praying for attention, right, I was fresh out of college, just had a corporate job. So I'm making a little money, but I feel empty, like the job is kind of dull. It's got a nice paycheck, of course, but it doesn't feed me in any way. And so one January, I'm almost positive it was January 2015, I discovered this site called medium.com. And I have a full-time job, very busy, you know, family, like I mentioned, but I say, okay, you know, I'm going to get up at six o'clock every morning and write for this site. And I didn't publish every day, but I would publish once or twice a, or twice a week. And already you could tell like the pace now is way different. Like most people get on and they're like, if I can't do this 87 times a week, it's not even worth doing. But back then I was like, okay, slow and steady is all I got. So I sit down every morning, 6 a.m., do the writing. And slowly I, I start to grow and I'm figuring some things out. Like there are a lot of blanks for six months. Probably I get ignored by all, but you know, my, my mom, who, who is, of course, my biggest fan, as we already know, she's reading my posts and my dad and um, a couple of people. And I go along and I'm figuring out, OK, what works and what doesn't work as far as online writing? How do you write a good headline? How do you write a good ending? All these things. And I think six months in is probably where the turn started to happen. Um, I had one post called The Answer is No. It went viral. Like the weekend I was thinking about quitting, I like write that post, I release it. I go off to um, my in-laws cabin in the woods. I just leave it all. I'm like, okay, I got to take a break from everything. While I was away from the internet, away from my phone, I come back to a post that has hundreds of thousands of views. And it's just a shock to the system. Cause I'm like, oh, I didn't even know there were this many people out there, like regardless of, you know, who was doing the writing. And so that was kind of my first real, I don't know, hit. We talked about the dopamine hit, but that that was like heroin for me. Yeah. Going viral was like heroin. It was the biggest rush I had ever received. And, you know, as you alluded to, I, I chased that high and nothing else for probably three more years. Like, I didn't care what the topic was. I didn't care if I was an expert. I didn't care if I knew anything about anything. I would write what I thought would be the most attention grabbing thing. And the results came like, you know, almost a hundred thousand followers on medium, several tens of thousands elsewhere. But again, I hit this moment of this isn't feeding me. Like I went all of this way. I did all of this side hustling things that I thought I loved to end up with the same feeling that I had in that corporate job of this is empty. This is not something I like to do. The money arc went very similarly, right? Like when the payouts started coming, it was I hadn't learned my lesson. It was like, oh, got the hit. It's a new heroin, right? It's a new drug. And I chased that for a while. But these days I've I've come to terms with, okay, attention is kind of empty. Okay, money after a point, because let's like money's great, but after a point, chasing money is kind of empty. So I came all the way back full circle to why did I why did I want to start writing in the first place? When I was in the depths of my corporate job like bored out of my gourd, literally reading like company manuals because I had nothing else to do. I, I just wanted a spark. I wanted some outlet to figure out what I was figuring out and express what I thought about life. And so now that's, that's what I try to do the most. And I think that's the biggest benefit. Now we see the creator economy. We see all this money coming in, people getting huge followings and all that. Take it from a guy who's been there 
the greatest benefits of writing aren't that. It's just getting more in touch with yourself and understanding what you believe in a world full of people that have no idea what they believe. Mm. So interesting, as you described this dopamine hit you were getting when you were seeking attention. Mm. Now, you know, it makes a lot of sense to me when we look at TikTok and the rise of that platform where anybody can create an account and get that dopamine hit for going viral. Um, it, it, it answers yes. everything you need to know on why it's been such a popular platform for today's youth. Yeah. And you, they have studies on this, right? You've heard this, you may have heard the study about the the rats and the cocaine, right? So they put these rats in a cage and they had a lever and he said, okay, rats, you could choose between this lever or food. And if you hit this lever, you get like a cocaine hit. Basically, if you hit this one, you get food. If the lever was you hit it and you get that hit every time, they would eventually plateau off and go back to the food. Cause they were like, this doesn't like, this hurts me long-term. And they would go back to the food. But when they change the variable to sometimes that gives you that big cocaine hit and sometimes it doesn't, the rats literally killed themselves, like sitting there trying to get that hit again. And that's social media. Sometimes oh. you get it, sometimes you don't. But because it's not predictable, that's why so many of us are, are hooked and, and stuck in that world. What a great metaphor for social media. Boy, oh boy. Now, you know, the Writers Guild mm. of America, they recently went on strike. The people who write for all the TV yeah. shows and movies, they're not writing right now. So the new TV shows yeah. and movies are not going to get made. And the last time I checked, the sides seem to be very far apart. The Writers yes. Guild of America total asks would come to $429 million a year. The studio's mm -hmm. current offer, last time I checked about a week ago, stands at about $86 million a year. So how long can this strike go on for? Yeah, so you're looking at two sides that are roughly, what, $350 million right. apart. That's a, that's a fair gap. <laughs> they I would got say, some yeah. They, they got some ground to cover. You know, I, I get on podcasts and it's like, it's, I always try to decide whether I want to give a real prediction, right? Because best case scenario, you're right. And you look really smart. Worst case scenario, it resolves tomorrow or before we even release this episode <laughs> and you look like a goofball. I, based on this strike versus the last strike, because in 2008, there was a similar strike and it was similar motivations. Like you had this new wave of technology back then it was streaming. Now it's AI. We can talk about that in a minute, but writers just wanted, they wanted as much of that, pie as they could get they knew there were all these new streams of income coming in and they said hey wait a minute like we create these shows producers have their role too but obviously it's creative versus business you got two big poles that only sort of understand each other and so that strike went on i think four or five months less than half a year it, it was wrapped up pretty quickly everyone was kind of happy we got some good snl skits out of it and life continued as normal <laughs> this one i'm i'm just not so confident um last week you know at time of recording this it's kind of late may but recently um the writers guild came out and said we're not we're not going to do the tony awards like we're, we're not going to write for the jokes for the Tony awards. We're not going to show up for the Tony awards. We're just going to blackball that whole thing. And the Tony awards for those who don't know is, is like Oscars for Broadway, right? Oscars for plays. Mm -hmm. There is no marketing anything that matches the Tony's for Broadway Four of the five plays that are nominated for best musical don't even make the money back like week over week to put on the show. So like, Think about Hamilton, right? This huge standout musical because of, you know, a big charismatic star. That is so rare. It's hard to express how how unusual it is for a standout hit to happen. And even that show needed the Tonys to get its like second leg of life on the on, on the stage and have all this new crowd come see it and come ultimately, you know, a billion dollar show. Mm -hmm. But most shows won't. And especially without the Tonys, you're looking at a world where, a lot of theaters just going to go dark because they have to go dark. And that speaks to the resolve on the writer's side of, yeah, we're pretty serious about this. Like we're willing to jeopardize this whole line of business in which we participate because we need a fair stake, not only in the compensation, but we need some kind of assurance around AI that you're not going to like fire 200 of us and put in chat GPT in, in our place kind of thing. 
Yeah, I'm with you. I, I agree. I think that this is going to last a little while here. Um, you now, you know, let's talk about ChatGPT. I mean, the mm -hmm. WGA is also asking for contract language that ensures that AI is only going to be used as a tool, not yep. as a full on replacement for all the human yep. writers. So how much of a threat is AI and ChatGPT to the writers themselves? Uh, it's big. It, it's not big today. But it's 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 a legitimate threat. I to be honest with you, I don't I don't think they'll ever get that assurance. I think that AI will replace a significant chunk of staff writers, and I I hate that because I'm watching AI come up and saying, oh, like I'm nervous too about about everything. I think everyone wants some kind of assurance that new technology will not disrupt their way of life. And if I'm looking back over the next two thousand or the past two thousand years, it hasn't happened. Like you look at the car door or the, the car came out with Henry Ford, put a whole lot of horse breeders and manufacturer, you know, like that whole business went basically to zero in a year. The typewriter comes out and suddenly you don't need people handwriting and making all these receipt copies and all these other things, you know, printing the actual copy machine eliminates more work. And AI to me is the next step of that. It's, it's not today, right? Like, Today, a producer could not replace a team of writers and produce any show of quality whatsoever. But five years from now, is it feasible to think a team of five could generate 24 episodes of a sitcom with AI assist? Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow, that's yeah. just unbelievable to even think about and to try to wrap my arms around. Um, yeah, you've tough. obviously, you've become a great writer. You gained nearly 75,000 <laughs> followers online. You've uh, written and you've consulted on several books. One of them became an Amazon bestseller. Another was the 2021 business book of the year. So based yep. on all of your experience, how can our college student listeners right now, how can they use writing to maximize their study time at college? Man, this is, I'm so glad I came on this show because I get to relive all of the not so glory days of, of being in college. And as soon as you, as soon as I saw this question and I heard this question, I flashed back to uh, British Lit class 20, no, 2009. I graduated 2008, 2009. I have my first semester. One class is British Lit. And I like to read and I like to write already, even then. But even then, it was class starts at 10 30. Todd wakes up at 10 22 and runs across campus, right? To, to get there. Like we got our pajamas on, we got the long <laughs> messy hair. We're like blinking sleep out of our eyes and then trying to take notes on Beowulf. It's not a great situation. Uh, and my grades showed it, right? Like my, my grades were a perfect reflection of my habits at that time. And even when I moved from, from Martin Methodist to ETSU, I, I still wasn't all the way plugged in because and I, I'm going to try to say this in a way that doesn't sound arrogant. I, I, I did well in high school without a whole lot of like extra effort, right? That's just kind of the way, first of all, you're in a different environment. So it's like seven hours a day, you're in that building just by default, you're probably going to do better than an unstructured schedule or a less structured schedule with breaks in between where you go, hold on. Do I really want to study for this test or do I want to run to Taco Bell and like get a Baja blast? You're, you're <laughs> totally in control in that time. And it's difficult to make the right decisions. And so I'm, I'm an ETSU. I'm sure I'm trying to figure it all out. And I have this class called intro to psychology with, uh, with Dr. Chris Dula. Great guy, like hair. If you picture like, um, a seventies hippie, you pretty much have an idea of what, like your stock 70s hippie. He had long like hair down past his waist. He would play rock music while we were all and funk music while we were all loading into class and like pound six sparkling waters in an hour. It was crazy. Uh, and, he's, and he's passed away now of brain cancer, but it, which is a huge loss, not only to ETSU, but just the teaching profession as a mm -hmm. whole. Mm -hmm. But what he did, you know, when you teach anything 101, you're on the front lines, right? Like you're getting a lot of fodder, people who don't care about the class, people who don't want to be there. And in our case, it was 300 people in an auditorium, maybe 30 of which maybe we're going to get a psych degree, right? So the rest of us are just kind of there. And Chris Dula is doing this for a couple of years. And one day he realizes 
not many people are getting good grades in my class. And many teachers would say, okay, you know, it's just a result of they're not interested and all they got to do is get by and that's fine with me. But this guy was just a great teacher. He, he created a seminar from scratch on his own volition called how to study. And he advertised it basically in his, in his own classes. And he said, Hey, listen, all you guys are terrible at school. I love you, but you're awful at this. Please come <laughs> on Tuesday night to Brown Hall. We'll be in this room. And I'm just going to teach you how to study. I, I don't want to do any, it's not topical. It's not difficult. I'm just going to show you what I know. And so what he did was say, everyone has a limited amount of time. Everyone has access to a pencil and a spiral notebook. My best tip for you is to have a spiral notebook for every class write down the notes like as you're in class look at them that night look at them the next day and it's only a page at a time right so you he's not asking a lot he's like there's no flashcards there's no repeating there's no drills there's no textbook it's just write down what you remember look at it the next day then you're back in class write it down again and so that day you have two pages to review but it gets easier right because you've written it all down and you've reviewed it before and that was the way, like for me, that was the trick that got me through all of the rest of my classes, graduated with a, with a 3.9 and probably for honest, paved the way to what I do now, just because I was in the habit of writing so much of what I understood in, in different classes. I love it. I absolutely love that. Now, you know, the other thing that I think a lot of students right now are thinking about is relationships. So how mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. writing in order to create better relationships. Is that something that's even possible? I think writing in general is a way to clarify how you feel because the page can show you things that your mind will hide from you. So whenever you're coming on a critical decision, and actually this may be advice that destroys relationships to be, to be honest with you, but <laughs> if you're in a room with a notebook or a computer screen or whatever, and you're writing something I like to teach a lot to, to my own students and anyone who asks is stream of consciousness writing, which is there's no filter between your mind and the page. You're just going as fast as possible, trying to work out some problem in your head. And so maybe you're in this moment where you're trying to like define a relationship with a partner and you're going, okay, is this, are we exclusive? Are we open? Should we end this? I, I don't really know. And if you keep all that in your mind, it's stuck there. And it's because it's just hard to go logically from one thing to the next, all in the containment of your mind. So for relationships, I strongly suggest that stream of consciousness writing and go set a timer for five minutes, write everything, like don't filter yourself. And the first thing I should point out is like, this is going to be nasty and crass and bad. And you will spell everything wrong. That'll be the worst of your problems because you're going to go, oh my God, like my brain is terrible. Why would I think these things? But that's how in many ways you, you get to the, you get to the truth and you go, oh, okay, suddenly it's very clear. I don't actually like this person. Like this is not a place I see myself being long-term or in my case, why would I bother being with anyone else because this person matches me in so many ways and we already have so much built up trust and there's more good than there is bad and that's to me again writing being the exercise of clarity i would use it on relationships or romantic or otherwise to make sure you're giving and getting the proper amount in in every scenario that's excellent advice. And, you know, we should also talk about mental health because that's a huge yeah, concern yeah. right now for yeah. Gen Z. You know, I remember a time when I was working for a company and uh, all of my bosses, their values were just absolutely atrocious. Um, and I didn't know that <laughs> until I started working there. <laughs> and I probably should have yeah, gone yeah. to go see a therapist to kind of talk through some of this stuff. Um, but I didn't. And uh, I ended up, you know, years later, after I ended up leaving that company, um, I took a class in ethics in a master's program um, at Cumberland University in Lebanon. And, uh, and in this ethics class, our teacher basically said, you know, I want you to write about the conflict between ethics and business 
you know, and that intersection. Mm. And I started writing that stream of consciousness. I literally locked my door in my office and all day long, it was this stream of consciousness, all of this stuff that I needed to get out and put it onto paper so I can read it and process it. And it probably was the best therapy that I had ever been through. And so I guess my question for you is, you know, how can writing improve the students who are listening right now? How can it improve their mental health? Yeah. I think it's interesting that a lot of the things that make us feel better are now being scientifically validated to actually like now they have whatever equipment and technology and testing um, methods to verify that like, yes, doing this activity does make you feel better, which means like your hormones are aligned or your muscles are engaged or your brain's in the proper order or, wh or whatever it is. Writing is one of those things. They've, they've done studies at, um, at West Virginia and found that literally some of the benefits of writing are clarity of thinking, which I've talked about already, reduced depression and anxiety, um, immune system improvement. Literally, literally, there are studies that say, hey, if you write daily in journal, you will go to the doctor less often which is bonkers. Like that makes no sense that if I sit down with my little notebook every day and I'm going to go to the walk-in clinic four fewer times in, in every year, but that's, that's true. That's how it works. And so in place of a therapist, and I'm big fan of therapy, so long as you can be completely honest with the therapist, that that's my criteria is like, as long as there is that level of trust, which one is partly the therapist's responsibility and partly your responsibility to be that to be that open. That's what you're looking for when it when it comes to mental health. And in lieu of that therapy, do self therapy, right? Like the stream of consciousness is is an excellent exercise for this. Journaling is a good exercise for this. There have been more studies, and I I don't have them right here, but other universities have showed that writing about traumatic experiences eases the mental pain of those traumatic experiences because every time you write about it you're able to see it in a new perspective in a new light so not only the perspective of current you looking at a past event so you have the distance of time right which in your brain again if it's stuck in the mind it doesn't exist but if it's on paper you're like oh right that was a long time ago so not only do you have that, but you're able to see it through the lens of the other person who is involved, right? You're able to see it through maybe your own errors and judgment at that time that led you to this place. And you're able to provide context around what would otherwise be a you know, trauma and emotion literally living in your in your muscles and in your mind, um, staying with you from day to day and year to year instead of exercising that and in a way vomiting it out through a writing practice really good stuff you know your description earlier when you were talking about um, you know getting ready for your 10 30 class and you know waking up probably two <laughs> minutes before the class uh, your hair is a mess sure. you're still in your pajamas and, and you run to class expecting that you're mm -hmm. gonna you know execute perfectly at that point of course um, that's that's just like every one of our listeners okay every one of our yeah. listeners is doing the same exact thing right now but you've yeah. actually maximized your creativity through two exercises that you do first thing in the morning what are those yeah. exercises because our listeners need to know what that is yeah so you, you brought up something interesting by uh, bringing up the story of being in college again it made me think of high school as well because these are the only two periods like school at, at both levels right so elementary school high school and then college are the only times that you're grouped together by age so the bar what's possible what su what success looks like etc is set only by your peers until you get 22 23 24 you're out of college you're in the working world suddenly the bar is for guys who have and girls who have 20 years of experience right so i i think that's a helpful mindset shift to go hey listen like 
it's big fish, small pond thing, right? Like whatever you're swimming in now is nowhere near the depth of, of what's really out there. And so the sooner you can go, Hey, this isn't just like getting a better grade than Michael, who's sitting next to me in, in ethics class. This is about how can I participate and make myself capable of impacting the world in a broader way, whether that's, you know, a company of all ages or city and state legislator or, you know, beyond. Right. And so I think young people have the responsibility not only to learn, that's very important, but to understand how to prepare themselves for the world in which they are about to tumble. <laughs> and I, I'm choosing that word on purpose, be, that word on purpose, because the world feels so chaotic and stressful right now, particularly for people in, in Gen Z and beyond. For me, again, I, I promised the tactics, so we'll go there. There are two things. One is an exercise I call micro journaling. Micro journaling is for people who don't love the idea of just like sitting down with a notebook and talking about your feelings and your day and the stories and what your girlfriend said to you in geology class. And it, it takes that and, and shrinks it down to something more concrete. Micro journaling is, is three parts. You write the date and that's actually part of the exercise because today's May 19th, which is dating this episode. So sorry, but today's May 19th, 2023, there will never be another May 19th, 2023 again, right? So first level is cognizance of what's rare, which is right in front of you. The next step is to write 10 things. Doesn't even matter what they are. Ideas for businesses, ideas for dates, ideas for studying, ideas for social events on the weekend, just 10 things. And what happens with that exercise is you get about halfway through and then your brain like runs out of stuff and you go, uh, I don't, I don't know. I can only name like five business ideas today, but that friction right there is what you need to, to push through. And really 10 is kind of arbitrary, but that, that moment of your brain going, I don't think I have anymore is what activates the rest of your mind to go, well, now, but now let's get creative. And I find whenever I do that first, very first thing, every, it's, it's much easier to do it throughout the day. And then the third part of micro journaling is just writing something you're grateful for, right? Which is basically a bookend of, of the first part, which is going, here's the day, here's what I'm grateful for. If nothing else, it's a day that I got to live and a thing that I can't believe gets to be in my life. The second exercise is simply just writing a story from your life. And I think, you know, if your audience is, is college students, they're going, man, life is so slow. Like I remember everything that happens. There will be a time where you're going to look up and go, holy moly, I'm 35. What happened? Like I have a house and a dog and a kid and a wife, like where, or, or a husband, where did, where did any of this come from? And I found that I had just like drifted, um, basically three or four years of my life. And I, I couldn't remember what happened And my, you know, somebody would tell a story be like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. And so now every day, this is a trick I picked up from uh, from Matthew Dix. He has a great book called Story Worthy, which is a, a must read, I think, for anybody who wants to write today. Um, but just one event, one thing that happened. And so as you scroll through that pile, you go, okay, like, my life does have meaning. There are things that happened uh, that, that I remember and were worth doing. Now I'm starting to see all those connections between writing and mental health. I love that you were talking yes. about sharing yes. what you're grateful for every single day because, you know, mental health, I mean, if this is something that, you know, is impacting you right now, uh, just sharing what you're grateful for every single day, I think can really help you through some of those difficult times that we all go through, me, you, everybody on this planet. If you're a human, just being grateful for things and sharing that every day will help you. I promise. Yes. Yes. Yes, oh, for sure. Man. Such great stuff. Now I'm about to embark on writing a dissertation. I'm a, in a doctorate program uh, in assessment, learning and student success in higher education at MTSU. So, <laughs> so knowing <laughs> that, how can all of our writers in college and maybe me too, make their papers yeah. and written assignments more memorable? 
gosh. Okay. So first of all, sorry, because I know <laughs> disser dissertations are not to be taken lightly. So I wish you uh, must gust much gusto and courage on your uh, treacherous journey, my friend. That's right. Godspeed. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I'll, I'll give a blanket tip and then I'll kind of take it down into the nuance, maybe make it a, a bit more actionable. I think the the best thing that you can do now to make papers more memorable at any level is just just to tell a story of some kind and it doesn't have to be like a novel because most people hear, hear stories and they think novel and they'll go back to like peter rabbit from their childhood days and go like i don't i'm not going to tell a story what are you talking about but the basic structure of a story fiction or non-fiction made up a reality is here's the thing that we wanted here are the problems that happened when we tried to get it. And then here's how we overcame those problems to be successful. So Janie was having a lot of trouble getting her GPA up in her sophomore year. She had a phone call with her mom and her mom said, hey, if you don't get your GPA from a 2.5 to a 3.1, we're not going to pay for any more of your school. Janie says, oh my gosh, I got to figure this out. And then she goes, all right, how can I improve? I'm going to try studying by myself, but I'm too distracted. I'm going to try going to a tutor, but I can't show up on time. I'm going to try studying with friends, but that only works every so often. And so these are, these are the problems that come up. She tries time and time again. So in your dissertation, it's way more complex than that, I'm sure. But the story of like, here is a student that was struggling. Here are the ways that she failed or he failed. And then here are the things that that stuck and so maybe we can use these to integrate into the curriculum as a whole to you know capture some of those uh some of those folks who who may fall out and never graduate and get the education they want and paid for the the micro version of that is, is just to build tension right like what's at stake if you don't tell people what's at stake why would they read the paper at all? It's not a requirement, which I find shocking. Like it's not a requirement to talk about what's at stake or the tension of your paper in, in any level, but that's what makes it more memorable. Suddenly, if you have a, you know, Voldemort in your Harry Potter story, so to speak, it's a lot more like, oh, it's not just Harry wandering through school. There, there is some force that is trying to get in the way of what you want to accomplish. And the better you can illustrate that problem the, the more memorable and the easier it is for someone to buy into your, your argument of like, oh yeah, like we should do something about this. Mm. Well, now you're making me feel a lot better about focusing on Good. qualitative research versus quantitative research. Oh, and totally. it's going to be all about early, early warning mechanisms of hazing in college fraternities and sororities to help oh. save lives. So yeah. yes, there, yeah, yeah. there is a real reason why we're doing this. You know, we're going to yeah. save lives with this dissertation. <laughs> I already want to read it. Yeah, see? And exactly. That's the highest stakes, right? Because we got the young people stakes. who are losing the highest stakes. It's perfect. You got to yeah, put it that is in. the highest stakes that I can think of. I mean, I can't think of any more mm -hmm. higher stakes than human lives yeah. and especially young college students that have their entire careers ahead of them, yet it's no cut doubt. short because of honestly stupidity. Um, so it's yeah. just complete stupidity. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, so I'm going to be invested in that and, uh, and yeah, I'll definitely share my dissertation with you. I think you're going yeah, to please do. Be to be very, very good. Um, now, all right, we do love great food here at the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. And I know you know my neck of the woods in Franklin, Tennessee. I know mm -hmm. that you know Nashville, Tennessee very well. I need to know yeah. what is your favorite restaurant in the area so I can go and check it out. Okay. So where have you, tell me a couple places that you really like and I'll see if I can tailor the recommendations. <laughs> I mean, you know, here it's interesting because I'm actually a transplanted New Yorker. So, you know, okay. in, in, you know, New York, you know, or on the, you know, East coast somewhere, I'm looking for seafood. I can't get that, you know, here in, mm, yeah. in the Nashville area. It just doesn't exist. Landlocked. Landlocked. Yeah. So that's a mistake. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I end up gravitating to barbecue is is very good. Mm -hmm. So I'll stick to the barbecue choices. I think that's excellent here. Uh, you know, yeah. um, there's a ton of restaurants that I go to in the Gulch. 
Uh, you know, I, I tend okay. to like that area as well because I have some really good food there. So I like, you know, I like the higher end restaurants. Um, I like the trendy restaurants because I, I like to do a lot of people watching. And so there's a lot of that okay. going on in Nashville. So does that cue you in on maybe something that I would like? <laughs> yeah, that's really good. So that's, that's part of barbecue. It sounds like you're covered, but if you, so we'll, we'll go by location. If you're yeah. in 12 South, like yeah. that area, yeah. there's a restaurant called, um, I think Edley's is the yes. one that's over there. The yeah, barbecue, you've good. been there. Oh okay. yeah. It's delicious. Edley's is Fantastic. great. Great barbecue right, right up the street from that is a restaurant called bar taco. Yeah. Bar tacos. One of them. Have you been there? Of course, it's fantastic. Okay, all right, all right, all right, good. So you're two for <laughs> two on it. Been... Did you get the watermelon margarita? No, is that a bar okay. taco? There's a watermelon margarita at bar taco that is just oh, chef's kiss. Um, that have someone amazing. to drive because they're strong, but they're yeah. they're they're delicious. All right, um, that sounds like a plan. I'm definitely I, gonna check that out. High end. I'll give you a really high end one to leave with. Um, Chef Chef Sean Brock owns a restaurant in Nashville. Now I'm blanking on the exact street name, but it's called the Continental. It's part of a big hotel downtown. Uh -huh. If you want to go a place and pay a lot of money and get like <laughs> that experience on that level, um, check out the Continental. That'll All be, right, that's a new the, one for that'll me. That'll be the date night. Yeah. That is a new one for me. My wife is going to be very happy that you recommended the Continental. That's it. Sure. <laughs> Next anniversary. Yeah, no that's doubt. It. She'll feel loved. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. So if all of our listeners, if they want to connect with you, maybe they want some help in starting their own book that they want to write, or maybe they just want to invite you to come out and speak on their college campus about writing and the value that it brings, where should they go to connect with you? Yeah, I'd love that. Um, either way, I'm open to inquiries on all sides. You can go to whatmakesgreatwriting.com. That's the site that I run. There's a, there's a page to sign up right at that URL. Um, once you get the welcome email, just forward it to me and tell me where you came from and what you want. I talk to literally everyone who comes in the door. So I'd love to talk to you. That sounds great. What makes great writing.com. Go and check out Todd's website, sign up, and uh, he'd be more than happy to help you get your book off the ground. So, Todd, thank you so much for sharing such great information with our college students. You have no idea how helpful that is for everybody listening. So, thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Honestly, this was fun. And next time we'll just talk about restaurants for half an hour. <laughs> That's, that sounds good to me. Right up my alley. So thank you so much. Thank you to our listeners for checking out our show today. If you enjoyed it, please make sure that you like it on social media, share it with other college students. And we hope to see you on another episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks so much. And we'll see you next time. 